So um, I've been at the Brooklyn Children's Museum uh, since 2015. I'm actually going to be leaving the museum in about a month to lead an organization called The Reading Team, which is in, based in Harlem, where I live. Um, but the museum is the first children's museum in the world, um, and that is a very amazing thing because it is still located in the same place where it was founded. Um, and it, it is a sort of a trend center, you know, amongst other institutions across the country. Um, we focus on arts and science, and so we're thinking constantly about how to create an interdisciplinary approach to learning um, through our collection. We have 30,000 objects, which Unfortunately, we don't see enough of, but we're working very hard to you know, bring the collection objects and the sci natural uh, scientific specimens out so that um, children can learn by touching and through other sensory engagement about the world around them. Um, bef before I, I came to the museum, I was working at the Laundromat Project, which is a community-based arts organization that works in Harlem, Bed-Stuy, and Hunts Point. Um, and the organization really uh, sees artists as the creative catalyst that can make a lot of things happen. Artists live everywhere. Um, there are many, sure many artists in the room. Um, and uh, with all of the skill sets that artists bring and sort of their perspective and their relationship to their neighbors, they can be the catalyst for um, creating uh, very robust conversations around quality of life topics that are impacting them um, and their neighbors. And so the organization, which has been around um, since 2005, um, works with artists in a very creative way to basically resource them to have these conversations through um, visual and performing arts-based projects in their neighborhoods in the three neighborhoods that I mentioned. So I was the first staff member outside of the founder at the Laundromat Project, so it's an organization that's very near and dear to my heart that, um, that really, I think, um, does very important and unique work. I mean, it's unique and it shouldn't be unique, it should be normalized, but, um, but you know, there are not that many organizations that are working that way. So I will turn the floor over to Chris, who will share a bit about his background. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Batiste, and I'm an 11th grader from the Brooklyn Institute for Liberal Arts. When you're 16, you try not to pay attention to the microaggressions and the stereotypes imposed on you. I mean, in 10th grade, I was more focused on making sure I got my homework in on time or making sure I was passing my classes. But when you see with your own eyes how segregated your education is, you simply can't ignore it. It isn't the type of thing that goes away naturally. In October of 2015, I worked with my English teacher and the organization Integrate NYC for me on changing footnote one of the chancellor's regulation testimony to allow schools to consider race when enrolling students in order to prevent racial isolation and promote diversity. Nearly two years later, I am now an official member of the nonprofit organization Integrate NYC for me and I'm working towards achieving equality in schools through improving relations, reforming enrollment policies, and changing the way resources are allocated. Thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all about something that is not only relevant to me and my circumstances as a student in New York City, but what I feel like has affected all of us one way or another. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Max Friedman. I want to thank uh, Thanks all for inviting me and for some historical society. Um, I, I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, in one of my lives, I work for the New York Historical Society teaching and writing curriculum. Um, so that's one way that I have into the education world. But uh, in the, the hat that I'm going to wear today is as a researcher. Um, I got my master's degree in design and urban ecologies from Parsons School of Design. And I decided to focus on uh, education and housing uh, and the relationship between the two in this area, in central Brooklyn. So um, I started with uh, kind of two questions. Uh, one was, um, I live in Bed-Stuy uh, in, if you don't know the geography of the New York City school system, um, there are 32 community school districts, or 32 geographic community school districts. I live in District 16, which is basically the eastern half of Bed-Stuy and a sliver of Crown Heights. Um, and I've, I started out wanting to know what was going on in District 16, which I found pretty early on had a, a in the 2015-16 school year, the schools, the traditional schools in District 16 were enrolled at 53% of their capacity um, to have students in them, and that was a big deal, and those numbers had declined really rapidly over the preceding 10 years, and I wanted to know why. Um, and I also wanted to know what we could learn um, about the history of politics and organizing um, around the schools in, the, in District 16 and in Central Brooklyn uh, in order to inform the way that we 
uh, act today. Um, and uh, I found a couple things which I'll try to briefly summarize. Um, one is uh, I wanted to emphasize really the reciprocal relationship between schools and neighborhoods. And what I mean by that is um, the way that schools can have an impact on the neighborhoods and the way that neighborhoods can also have an impact on the schools. So obviously bed is going uh, through a lot of changes. Um, and one of the factors for the under-enrollment of the schools in District 16 uh, is gentrification. Um, gentrification in the early stages uh, will displace families and replace them with either families that don't have children, people who don't have children, or people who have children and choose not to send them to the local schools. Uh, and that can lead to the end to under enrollment in the schools. Um, and that's an obvious way in which uh, what's going on in the neighborhood can have an impact on what's going on in the school. Um, but what is less often talked about is the way in which what happens in the school can accelerate actually what's happening in the neighborhood. So for example, once there is a kind of critical mass, once the tide turns and uh, upper middle class and or white families start to send their kids to a local school, um, those families tend to cluster in one or two schools in the area. Um, and that process can actually accelerate the gentrification process that's going around in the school. It can, can start to raise property values in that area, which then feeds back into what's happened with the demographic change in the school, which then feeds back into the dem demographic change in the area, and so on and so forth. Um, and then um, what I wanted to talk about, I'll talk about briefly in terms of the history. Um, and I, my, my kind of big takeaway was just that it's really important that we not talk about education equity, which we'll talk about more about what that means, um, in a bubble um, as a kind of practical necessity. Uh, what I think the history of this shows is that those of us who want to work towards educational equity have to uh, address the citywide, nationwide, and global processes that are driving the flows of capital, housing development, and infrastructure investment um, that are really shaping what's going on in the schools. Um, I'll leave it there, but thanks for having me. My name is Stan Kennard, and first I want to thank Weeksville and I guess Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Movement Center, I heard you call their name out, and all the people that have facilitated this conversation, which I feel is, has the potential to be a very important conversation. So I was born and raised in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, in uh, 1949, so I'm just telling everybody my age. You know, I'll say that, it's a long time ago, it's a long time ago. And uh, I went to college at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and I uh, went there in 1967. Uh, and when I got there, there were only 42 um, black people, black students on the campus out of approximately 16,000 students. So we were less than one half of 1% of that population. Uh, students began to mobilize and organize out of necessity because we needed one another uh, in order for us to survival, to, to survive and to be what I call sane. And we um, were involved in the creation of the first Black Studies Department in the nation in 1968, uh, the Du Bois Department of African American Studies. We took over a building on campus and established it as the New Africa House our Cultural Center. And during that time, I was coming back and forth to Brooklyn and was very much influenced by the work of G. Tuusi and others that were involved in Uhura Sasa and the organization called the East Cultural Center, um, which then was the preeminent and became the preeminent cultural organization probably on the East Coast. Uh, when I graduated, I came back to Brooklyn and was propelled to continue that work. And that work um, involved me becoming the first executive director of Brownsville Heritage House in, uh, in Brownsville, uh, which is on the top floor of the library on Dumont and what is now Mother Gaston Boulevard. After that, I was involved in the development and the founding of an organization called the Carter G. Woodson Cultural Literacy Project, which was based at several New York City public schools, and one of them being Boys and Girls High Schools and uh, public schools in uh, the Ocean of Brownsville, District 23 community. And the primary focus was on the teaching and the study of African history and culture. So that has been my primary work. I'm still uh, employed at Boys and Girls High School, but I only wear one hat. I may change 
what he looks, but I don't know where one hat, and that is for the liberation of our people. That is for the uh, development of a cultural aesthetic, uh, and that in working, still working towards the teaching of African history and culture in the New York City public school system. We are just uh, launching a campaign called Black History Every Day, and that came out of discussions about what do we do during this short 28-day uh, month that we call Black History Month, uh, which the New York City public school system has decided that we're going to take a week out of that and we're going to have a uh, winter break. And so I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone for sharing. Um, so let's start the conversation with uh, a question of what is education equity look like? What does that mean to each of you? And and you don't have to go in order. You can... Well, I don't want to call anything educational equity. There's nothing that exists called educational equity because it doesn't exist. So I don't know what we're talking about now. What do we want? What I'm advocating is something called cultural equity, and that's a little different. And, and People did like some groundbreaking work. Uh, Martha Vega and Esmeralda uh, Simmons uh, were involved in these discussions um, many, many years ago. And they have a book that has come out called uh, Voices from the Battlefield, which talks about educational, cultural equity. Their UNESCO in 2001 actually uh, passed a declaration of cultural equity, and it deals with like people uh, of color having their voices heard, having their voices recognized. And right now, there is no curriculum in the New York City public school system that deals with the voices of people of color. You know, students have to pass five regions in uh, English, math, science, uh, global history, US history. The majority of the people in the New York City public school system are people of color, they're black and brown people, but yet there is no history, uh, there is no culture. Uh, that is being taught about their uh, experiences on any kind of consistent basis. So it doesn't exist. Uh, New York State, um, when the lawsuit was filed many, many years ago, the campaign for fiscal equity, and it was litigated in the courts, but yet that money has not come down yet. So it doesn't exist, as far as I'm concerned. It just doesn't exist, which really contributes to the failure of the New York City public school system, where the majority of black and brown children are failing. Mm -hmm. And even when they graduate, when they go to college, the majority, the overwhelming majority of them are classified as not college ready, and then they got to take remedial courses all over again. So I'll stop right there. Uh, yeah, I'll jump on that and say, if you don't know, the state of New York owes the New York City Public School $4.3 billion, uh, which has not been paid since, I don't know when that lawsuit was resolved, but it's been a few years now, and the state continues to owe the New York City Public School system $4.3 billion. It's called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. Mm. Um, anyway, I agree with you completely. I don't know what educational equity means because it doesn't exist. Um, I will... I, I think two possible ingredients to it beyond the cultural equity are, are what I will call in a general sense power uh, and resources. And the only point I want to make about equity is that um, you need both uh, because, well, resources without power, if you get more resources to a school but you don't think about how power is distributed through the process of getting the resources to that school, that's what, uh, let's say, unfettered gentrification looks like. Um, and power without resources is like democracy without resource distribution, which means that it tends uh, still to reinforce the current patterns of who has power and who doesn't have power. Um, so for example, and you could talk about this much more than I can, but for a long time, the uh, setup of the New York City public school system was, uh, what was under what was called the decentralization law, um, which established local school boards that um, did not have as much control as people like Tito Ayusi were advocating for when that was going on in the late 60s, but had some more control than the community education councils have today. Um, and they were not resourced. So the school boards in areas where the people who lived there had more resources functioned more effectively than them in general. Um, than the ones that didn't. So, power and resources. I looked at it as if um, there were two types of 
trying to find like the definition of educational equity. And I came to the conclusion that there would be two types. The first being diverse and integrated schooling, and the other where resources are distributed equally to schools with racial demographics different than that of the majority. Um, one problem that students in the inner city such as I face or have faced are the few, if any, extracurricular and opportunities provided uh, to schools. In Brooklyn, most schools have a basketball team, but what else? What good is one sports team to me when I'm struggling to understand trick because I'm studying from an outdated textbook? In my neighborhood, you're lucky if you find a high school with two AP classes. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, specialized high schools such as Brooklyn Tech have 18. Educational equity here would be my little brothers no longer having to travel to a school 20 minutes away and out of their neighborhood when there's one right around the corner. When the correlation between unequal distribution amongst apartheid schools and not only the school's performance but the performance of the children are as blatant, are as, blatant as they are now, there's a need for an immediate change. Thank you. <laughs> so the next question that I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna preface um, with, maybe it's experience that you all are also having if you have young children. I am mom to a four-year-old and an 11-month-old. And so the four-year-old, obviously, we just, everybody, anybody in the room that has like a, a four-year-old, five-year-old? Okay. So if you are, are, if you are pursuing public schools as the option for next year, then you probably got your acceptance letters in the mail. And, um, and that's an interesting process, right? So school in general in New York is an, an interesting process. And I've had this conversation with my husband quite a bit about where are we going to send Isla? Where is she going to go to school? Is she going to go to school down the street? Is she going to go to, which is our zone school? Is she going to go to the school that's a few blocks away from our zone school? Is she going to go to a non-zone school? Is she going to, are we going to do independent school? Okay, so good news, we're not doing independent school. But we're, we are grappling with where to send her. You know, we're taking tours, we're trying to understand how, what is the approach of the teacher to the curriculum? Is there an opportunity and space for, um, cultural understanding in a creative way. All of the teachers, every every teacher I've seen is stressed. They have standards to meet. They have the Danielson framework. They gotta do all the things. Gotta cross the T's, dot the I's, and they have that pressure from their principal to deliver on what is happening in the classroom. And that can obviously hamper the learning process because you are trying to reach benchmarks and you're not necessarily present enough or you can't be, you know, to just, you know, shape the curriculum so that it is relevant to all the people that are in the room. So I, I preface this question with my own sort of um, journey. Uh, how do we create the just and, how do we create equity in, in schools and create equitable places of learning for children, period? How does that happen in this landscape where there is gross disparity? I know we're gonna we're gonna answer it today, guys. We're all <laughs> <laughs> so we have to we absolutely have to answer it. But first, um, people of color have to, and I hope I'm not offending anybody when I say that in the room. But I have to say that because that's my experience. I uh, have to, well, let's say all people, but people of color in particular, because that's what the majority of the population in the schools in District 16, 17, 23, 19 are. Uh, have to feel empowered and have to once again advocate as they did in the 1968 community control of their schools and become the architects of their own education. There's a book that will came out in it's called The uh, Architects of Black Education which from 1865 to uh, 1954, which like after slavery, what are we going to do with the black folks in America? And, you know, folks very cleverly, and I'm talking about the robber barons, uh, determined this is the kind of school system that we're going to establish in America. It hasn't changed very much. It's a failed school system that has, really has nothing to do with black and brown folks in terms of their enlightenment. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So I think that, like, G2, and those folks in the late 60s were absolutely correct when, in talking about community control of our schools, and we have to be the architects of our own education. I think that we have to start with a cultural foundation. 
There was a study that came out about two years ago, the Harvard Pittsburgh study, which is on racial pride, which says that when um, black students are exposed to information about their history and their culture, that they do better on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. That's the first test that is, comes forth with real empirical data says they do better. So if in fact, testing is the primary criteria, mm -hmm. then it's gotta be about us. So one of the things that we need to advocate for is a black studies region. See, this thing never trickled down to the public school system. There is no course teaching the black experience in the New York City public school system. I had a recent conversation with Dr. Young, and he confirmed that. And that's something I think we need to look at. Education is a state right. I mean, that's something under the reserve clause of the Constitution. But you know, how much are we actually in contact with the Board of Regents? How much are we in contact with our state representatives? So, yeah. um, I feel as though by voicing our opinions, we demand to tension. If we advocate for just and equal educational opportunities, it can be achieved. Watching the news after this recent election has taught me that like, if you stand up for yourself and uh, voice yourself and your opinions, that it can make a difference. Too soon we suppress our, our ideas because we see them as trivial or say to ourselves, oh, um, what can I do? I can't do anything. I'm only one person. I mean, to this day, that's still me at times, but I feel as though by speaking up, one voice join, uh, joins collectively with people who share the same idea. And as you, as you and that protest gain attention, uh, the people in power notice it and we're able to make the necessary changes. Yeah, this is a big question. Um, I, so, um, I want to talk about uh, segregation and integration for a second, because you work with this group called Integrate NYC for Me, which I would love to know more about. Um, but one of the tricky things about school, well, first of all, I think we have to ask, like, we all kind of, we can kind of agree that segregation is a problem, but we have to be clear about why it's a problem. Um, because some of the literature on school segregation will say or imply that segregation is a problem because kids of color need to be closer to white kids or kids with more money because that's the only, you know, they will learn more effectively that way. Uh, and what we need to understand is that the reason that segregation is a problem is because of institutionalized racism and classism that presents the schools that are segregated from getting the resources that they need, as you described, right? Um, so we have to be clear about that. Um, and one of the reasons that we have to be clear about that is because in the current climate, in the current politics of talking about segregation and integration, um, folks are looking for um, what some people call integratable districts. So in the absence of a busing program uh, or some kind of transportation program across long distances uh, that would take people from one place to some place very far away, which is something that has done in the past and is politically uh, impractical now, apparently, um, and has lots of other problems for, anyway, I'm not gonna go down that road, but uh, folks are looking for integratable districts, which mean a district, uh, basically a district in which you have um, people of color and white people, uh, poor people and then upper middle class people living more or less side by side. What you have around the city is a lot of districts uh, and zones in which the schools are more segregated than the area around the school. Um, and so when you're looking for integratable districts, those are, that's, you know, that's where you find them. And those districts are the ones that are on the bleeding edge of gentrification. Those places are that way because of gentrification. So we have to look really hard at the possible unintended consequences of trying to use gentrification to get to integration. Um, because gentrification is a process that dislocates and relocates people based on race, based on economic status, based on social power. And if we don't address that, but we're still trying, but we're trying to use it to get to integration, the efforts uh, might be self-defeating, um, if that Can was I, clear. Because I really recently we addressed this question in a class that I'm teaching with a group of freshmen. Uh, and it's dealing, we're looking at the civil rights movement, and we are, uh, 
looking at like pre-Brown or right around that period, 1951, you know, the school in Farmville, Virginia called R. R. Moten High School, uh, which was fighting for quality education. I think we make this thing, distinction between uh, integration and the fight for quality education or the fight for, because we weren't really fighting for integration, we were fighting for quality education, which was the books in her school were inferior, the conditions of her school were inferior, so therefore they wanted to go to the other school. Same thing with Linda Brown in 1954. Uh, and she had to walk 20 blocks past her house to get uh, past her, past the white school, which had the good infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, the books, the gymnasium, the library, to get to her school. Uh, so when that case got litigated, put a number of cases together, and it called but separate but equal is what is unconstitutional now. And then the fight, 57 in Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas with Little Rock 9, uh, to integrate that school, but they really wanted a quality education and that's where it was provided. I think that where we find ourselves now is that our schools are segregated, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing, they're, they're diverse though, and some of the kids will say sometimes, I want diversity, and I say, yeah, well, you know what? You have diversity here. Mm -hmm. You got people from Trinidad, you got folks from Haiti, you got people from Barbados, you got them from South Carolina, you got them from Cuba, you got them from Bangladesh, you know? That, those are the kids that are in our schools, so schools, and we want the resources, and, and we also want the curriculum, because I think a lot of the racism right now, this is why I'm gonna stay here, is in the curriculum, it's in what is being taught. And I think that we can talk about class size, we can talk about all of this other stuff, but until we address the racism in that curriculum, as Councilman Barrett says, the racism in the budget, but in the school system, it's not so much, it's in the budget, but it's in the curriculum. And until we address that, we're not gonna see any fundamental change. And people need to understand that we are in a war, we are on the battlefield. And right now, our schools are being taken over. I got a map, and if I knew this was going to be like this, I would bring it, but we can't figure out how to reproduce the map. It just kind of came to me, and it reflects the schools in central Brooklyn, the co-located schools, because that's the new language for taking control, the charter schools uh, in central Brooklyn, so District 13, District 16, District 17, District 18, 19, and 23 is a cluster of co-located and charter schools. And then when you get to the bottom of that map, where you're going out towards uh, the white parts of Brooklyn, there are no charter schools and there are no co-located schools. So therefore, they have large high schools with 4,000 kids, whereas in Boys and Girls High School and some of the schools in District 16, 17, they are underpopulated. So we got a real little situation that we're faced with right now. And it's like almost like war. And we That's why you can't find a, the right school for your for your child, you know. That's why it becomes a struggle. Mm -hmm. so, okay. so I feel there was another question, but I feel like you talked about it's come up, and I think everybody's answers. But the, the question was, you know, how universally accessible and culturally relevant are the curriculum is the curriculum um, and instruction in schools today? And I think we've we can agree <laughs> um, that it's not is not too uh, it's not too universal. But I feel like we can use that question to kind of look at schools that are doing it well. There are some schools that have a culturally relevant approach. I open that up to the audience. I open that up to our panelists. I, if there is one school that you can think of, I can think of one. Um, Little Maroons, any, anybody? Okay. Um, then you, please, by, by show of hands, um, who is familiar with the Little Maroons? Okay, great. And in, in the spirit of, uh, conversation, can someone, would someone volunteer to just share a brief overview of what Little Moons is and what their focus is and how they work with their young people? Yeah, don't all, don't all jump up and <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Anyway, okay. You probably don't. No, no, you go, we'll, we'll I, tag I don't team. I have first hand experience, but that's um, even, that's I wish Alphonse was in here, one of our tour educators. We welcomed the Little Maroons uh, two weeks ago here recently. Um, and of course we know the Maroons were, were the Africans enslaved in Jamaica. They refused to be slaves, they ran away from plantations, they created their own independent communities. Um, and so those are the Maroons. Um, I need a mic, because you're taking it. Um, yeah, so the Maroons, right, were independent folks, created their own communities. 
And so the Little Maroons is taking, I, I imagine they are using that history as a way to, um, I don't like the mic, um, <laughs> as a way to educate their kids. And so the kids came in and um, they all greeted Alphonse by calling him Brother Alphonse. Did he want to be referred to as Baba Alphonse? Um, so there is this, um, this uh, African ideology which is, which is uh, guiding the curriculum and how the kids are, um, are being educated. So there is a cultural base there within the education, really starting with identity. They all use um, different African languages. <laughs> they use different African languages and greetings, so you see that that cultural sort of foundation is, is what they're building. Mm -hmm. That's the little thing I know about the rooms. What about a public school? A little is not a public school. Exactly. school that is uh, a I think, do you, do you have a question? Uh, so, no, I don't know it. Okay. Um, I know folks that do good work, mm -hmm. but in terms of it being, because they are, dealing with the mandate of passing the test, mm -hmm. and everybody's stressed out, and mm -hmm. everybody's trying to meet benchmarks. So that's not a priority. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not a priority. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is the impact of it not being a priority. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, Dr. Woodson talked about the lynching in the classroom. That's what's happened to our kids. They know absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you know, I asked the question, and I challenge some of you to go and ask, Young students, junior high and high school, do they know who Shirley Chisholm is? Mm -hmm. They are clueless, clueless. Now, this is perhaps one of the most, particularly right now, it's Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. Then I ask them, can you name two, no, five, it's always five, um, African-American women leaders? Mm -hmm. And they will tell me Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, and then they're stuck. And they may say, I said, that are alive. Of course, mm -hmm. they can say Harriet Tubman. Then I'll say, Can you name five civil rights leaders? I've been doing this for years. They can't name five civil rights leaders. I mean, they will say uh, Martin Luther King, yes, and then they make it to Rosa Parks, and then they'll say Malcolm X, and I say, Malcolm's not a civil rights leader. And then they say, Okay, Harriet Tubman. I say, Harriet Tubman, because they have no sense of history. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that shit. Mm -hmm. I, I will say anecdotally, I've heard that. Um, I don't know firsthand that PS21 does some of this work. Okay. Somebody else who knows that school could speak to it. But I would, yes. I would like to add, because I have to leave soon, um, I think what would be helpful in all of this discussion is the question, education for whom, by whom, and for what purpose? Okay, did everybody hear that? So the question is education by whom, for whom, and for what purpose? And for what purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think any thing that what, what's happening now is that we've, we've been informed that the steamroller, as it has been rolling, it's here. And that there is a way in all of our buildings and high rise villages and surplus here to begin to engage our communities in whole, real, comprehensive ways, and in their own assessment of what has happened to their children, how many children they have lost to the prisons, so that you begin to stimulate our parents' thinking as to the system that we have been hoarding our children into, that that has failed. And that is the very preliminary, elementary conversations that we need to begin to have. So that this conversation as it's happening now, because I think we're having a conversation here, and I think it's very easy to have it here, but to have it on each of the hallways mm -hmm. and in the lobbies of these buildings is where that conversation has to be germinated, mm -hmm. because the jury is out. <laughs> <laughs> in the schools, instead of just mainstream or mainstreaming our children, we need to create a platform where our children can engage the world from a position of power, and that is an African-centered perspective. And it does not in any way segregate them or, you know, even though that's very important, we in Wicksville, 
It lets them engage the world from here. I am somebody, and this world is mine, and I claim it, so let's deal from that world. So I just... <laughs> So we have yeah. I just wanted to mention an initiative that is underway on this front that some of you may be aware of, of the Coalition for Educational Justice. Have you guys heard of this? I have. So they're just working recently. on pardon? Just recently. I yeah, got well, some email. Yeah, so yeah. they have they have a, a proposal that they put together, a platform that they're asking the Department of Ed to adopt that addresses cultural responsive education. There are some other folks doing it too, Paul Ford, the Jane Success Initiative, they do for intent as well. But all this to say, there's a rally that ties into Christopher's point about standing up mm -hmm. and asking for what we, what you deserve. On March 25th in the city, there's a rally for culturally responsive education. Mm -hmm. um, at uh, I think it's at African One Peace Plaza in the city or something. But I can make sure that that information gets circulated. But all this to say that what you're saying is true, and people recognize it. And I think there's a we're beginning to amass some energy to stand up and And then somehow they get stopped because the voices of the people stop and they're not really clear about this issue in terms of it being a priority and in terms of its importance. So, I mean, that, that's all I'm saying is that we got to really take this on, those of us that are going to take it on. And it's not just a matter of educators taking it on because educators in many regards are, you know, they got other, I mean, they're passionate, but it's like they get a little clouded about some of this stuff because they got pressure to get the kids to pass the test. What's the role of the artists and the cultural workers in, in, in the school system? You know, I mean, because I think that they are going to have to play a major role in terms of how the stuff gets uh, transformed. Um, I want to ask a question. Um, you know, we're talking about the importance of the school system and the integrating the education, like what the students are learning. Because mm -hmm. I know a couple years back, the Tim McGraw textbook released and stated that slaves were workers. Mm -hmm. And they came here right. as if they were compensated. Right. So hearing that, I'm like, that doesn't sound like it makes sense to me. Because like, I feel like as though we're taught that what African American children went through was, wasn't as bad or as problematic as we make it seem. And like, so we're taught 
um, history about the majority, which is like white people. I could tell you about the French Renaissance, the Ottoman Empire, why America hates communism, but I can't tell you why. I can't tell you. Like, the only thing I could tell you about my history and my cultural background is that um, it's about the African gold salt trade, and that's basically saying how uh, Africa helped benefit everybody else. And then it goes into slavery, which they try to warp and make it seem like it wasn't as big of a deal as it was. So we first need to look at integrating our education and then relations. We could have an integrated school, but how are we going to get the, uh, the races to interact with one another, to eliminate the stereotypes that we see um, portrayed in media and how um, like black people, when they go out in the street, they don't know how to act. That's why there's police brutality when that's not the case. Uh, mass incarceration, we talk about how, well, what we see is how um, black people on the street selling drugs, but it was in Conto, what is it? I, I can't even pronounce it, but during the Civil Rights Movement, yes, thank you. During the Civil Rights Movement, um, the police uh, implemented and put in drugs in the community to stop the Civil Rights Movement and stop uh, hippies from uh, making reform and being progressive. So I feel like the relationships have been like uh, ruined throughout the years since slavery and we need to work on um, resolving those, and then we can integrate schools. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I actually have a question. I've taught overseas um, in Egypt, and I've seen uh, similar events that are happening here actually trickling down mm -hmm. into the education system there. They obviously you know, have their national, they have the British, and they have the American and French systems going on there, um, and the students are actually suffering uh, in the same way, which is which is weird because that's African. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think we as a people can take capitalism and globalism into consideration when we look at education? Because we're dealing with money. We're dealing with interests that uh, place the education in a certain position and people in certain positions for us to move in a certain direction, unknowingly or unbeknownst to the people that are, you know, in the system, working in the system, or uh, trying to benefit from the system. How do we address that? How, how do we redirect our attention to that globalism and capitalism? Because this is the umbrella that we're living under. You understand? So we're looking at education, but where is it all coming from? Where is I, um, I mean, I brought up Little Maroons earlier. It's not a public school, but it, it is a cooperative. It's a parent-run cooperative. It was founded by, I think, maybe seven or eight parents uh, in bed -Stuy. And I, I tend to find my answers it, that in cooperative and anything, right? So how can we come together, bring our information, our resources, our interests, and like work together to solve a problem? Right, and the Little Maroons came out of that. So I, I know that that doesn't necessarily respond to a more systemic um, solution for the state of our schools and the curriculum that we are, that our students are experiencing. But I think it, where I personally am as a parent is like these are these are my options. So I'm going to choose one of the options, and then I'm going to fill in with the collaboration of my peers in my neighborhood to support what is happening or what is not happening in my child's classroom. But that is a stopgap. Um, that's not a systemic sort of solution. But I do think that that spirit of working together, organizing together, bringing together our shared interest and thus resources can overall it could it could be a very powerful it could be a very powerful solution. I mean I think most things can be solved when we are just like having a conversation and working towards a shared goal. But so we look at where we are. We're in Weeksville. So this is where we are. Mm -hmm. This is an intentional black community. Uh, that's what this was once upon a time. And folks came together and they created schools. I think one of the first schools was Black school was created right here. Mm -hmm. They had churches, they had a newspaper, but they built intentional communities. People are coming in our community now and they are crafting out the new bedside, what that's gonna look like. 
I mean, the charter schools are part of that, and that's not, you know, attacking charter schools necessarily, but people are saying, we want to build intentional community. This is what we want bed to look like. Mm -hmm. And I think that those of us that have been here for a long time, I think this is what we're going to have to look at some of these models. It's not like they don't exist. Uh, as far as your question is concerned about capitalism and globalism, until we control the schools and control what the curriculum is going to be, uh, that's not taught. I mean, you got economics class, but they don't teach much about capitalism in terms of what it really is and what it's really doing. Um, whether you like it or not, I mean, people should be able to have objective conversations about these things, and those kind of conversations don't take place um, for the most part in, a, in our school system right now. I think parents definitely have to be involved. I think that young people, like that young man that's on the panel's first time I'm meeting him, I think he's absolutely brilliant. But we need to hear the voices of our, of our youth. I don't think anything's going to change fundamentally until we empower the kids and we get them involved in the conversation. Because we're here today talking about them, but they're not here. Uh, for the most part, the parents are not here. So I think that they have to be involved in the conversation. They have a lot to say. Uh, yeah. Back off of that. I'm Christopher's mom. So. Well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations. <Thank you> so <laughs> he is so intelligent. I was just saying he is, oh my God, he's amazing. Thank I used to you. be so proud. Um, the students have to be more involved. Mm -hmm. They have to want more for themselves. Um, I'm on the school leadership team at his school as well. What so 17. 17. Mm -hmm. And um, we have recently, Chris is um, on the school leadership team as well, and includes um, principal, vice principal, um, a couple of the teachers, and Christopher and another student are involved, and they've just provided so many ideas and different viewpoints that we as older people have been out of school maybe for a while, and we're not, um, we're not sitting in the classroom every day. And they come home, they get these assignments, and they have to check this off and do this and complete this. But there's so much that they're missing out mm -hmm. on on their own. Um, so definitely the students have to want it. Mm -hmm. They need to stand up and demand it. Um, and parents have to support it. I have to go and do that level of work, and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable because I then also have to work, and it's like, how do we support the actual work that's being done to solve this problem at the same time organizing as the work is happening to deal with the institutional racism and all of the things that are preventing from the actual policy changes because I think it has to start with the work with the action and I feel like we're doing it backwards it's like oh the policy let's deal with the, the, the system and how do we deal with the curriculum and all these things and a matter of us empowering ourselves and realizing there's actually nothing stopping us from <laughs> teaching the children the truth and who they are and what their history is if we know that that's a really critical foundational piece to them actually being successful in the education system. So I guess I'm wondering like how, because it sounds like you have experience in doing this, like in your experience or in your like if when you think about it, how would that start? Or it went where it has started. How did that happen? Well, can I can I ask you like what what is your yeah. what what is the work that you do? Tell us a little bit about that. So um, so my partner and I we started in 2000 February of 20, 2015 after we spent a year living in Africa. When we were actually exposed to all of this information that I had completely no awareness of, and then coming back here with that awareness and seeing and everyone who's gone through a public school system knows how messed up it is. Like. We know how messed up it is, yet we just continue and move through life and not do anything about it. And those of us who are aware of it just pull our kids out and the system just continues as it is. So seeing that cycle, we just realized that we had to do something about it and that thing wasn't to just go and complain about it. It's like, all right, this information is available. How do we just teach it? So we work on a curriculum. So because my background is, mar is in marketing and my partner's background is in photography and digital media, we combine the two. We're in the era of social media. If we're talking about engaging and actually doing things that the children are actually going to be passionate about and care about, you can't just go and tell them about history, Africa, like 
they're just like, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. So you have to do it in a way that's strategic. So the art component of it and it being in a way that like really taps into the life that they live. Like they have Instagram, they have Facebook, they're recording videos, they're on Snapchat. So we teach them um, foundational like digital storytelling basics how to you do photography, how to um, storyboard, all of these things, how to tell their own story. But our curriculum is based in pre-colonial African history because that's what's not being taught. It's not necessarily, like I know that other aspects of history are really important, but it's the pre-colonial African history that's completely removed and that's really the source of that self-hate and like really hopelessness that a lot of people have in, in this neighborhood. I live in this neighborhood. so. Basically, we teach that history and we give the children the opportunity to retell the stories and the information that they're learning to their peers with what they're learning, with the photography, with the videography. And um, I've done the program and with various, you know, organizations that already have a following, like Bailey's Cafe on Malcolm X Boulevard. I worked with, um, I did their rites of passage with 30 children last um, summer and did the same Sankofa workshop where we do the same process. So basically we have to be creative about the way that we're gonna teach the history because it has to be engaging. They're so shut off to history because of the way that they're taught in schools that the media aspect of it definitely gives them a little more interest. And it's an interactive workshop. They're constantly doing something. It also gets them in the mindset of being producers and not constantly consuming information. Like, what do you think about this? And um, some the young brother on the panel actually mentioned that media played a huge role because education is not only going on in the classroom. That's miseducation. The, the miseducation also extends beyond the classroom because they're watching TV and they're listening to music that is constantly reiterating these negative ideas that they have about themselves. So that's the other aspect of the media workshop because we actually start here. When you, what, I, what we realize from our experience, when you go to history and you're like, oh, before slavery, um, your ancestors actually were not slaves, they were African people who were enslaved, which is something really hard to get into their minds. They don't, they can't make that connection from there to now, so they shut down. When you start with here, and you're like, oh, let me show you all these pictures, let me show you Nicki Minaj, let me show you um, Empire, and all these things that they see on TV, and you collage it, and they're seeing it, they're like, oh, I know who that is, oh, that's this rapper, that's this person, and then you ask them, you let them figure it out for themselves, what is that, what's similar about all of this stuff. What is, like, what, what do you see here? Oh, they're all in prison. They're all, like, and they'll start making those connections and they see how all these negative stories are needed. So then on top of that, you reinforce why it's important for them to create their own, tell their own story and create their own narrative. Because once they're aware, aware that they're not in control of the narrative that they're receiving, then they feel like, okay, this is important for me to tell my story from my own perspective instead of just constantly receiving what other people are saying. So there's a lot of different components to it, but I feel like the, the magic <laughs> formula that we've figured out is the media and the history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But do schools in New York like give kids options to anything else, like, you know, saying, oh, this trade, or you could do the, or is it always just like they're pushing you guys to go to college? Cause that's another thing I think harms harms kids too because I didn't want to go to college when I got there and I was like BS and wasting my mom's money because I didn't really want to be there but I knew but I was always told that you have to be there to go to college you know what I mean and I came out I was like one of the lowest kids in my class as far as my grades and I was really just there just hanging out where I could have been doing something else and could have been more productive and could have gotten to week school a little faster than what I did you know how um, you or high school, but this, the other thing is that they still have, they're still trapped in a system that makes them study so that they can do well on standardized tests. It's like, it, it's a chicken or egg problem. Right. So stories and experiences are useful, but then it's like, on the, in the larger context, you're like, you know, you know, maybe we should just be learning how to read and write and, and figuring out, like, mm -hmm. you know, having, having access to all of the resources and and working towards sort of fundamentally being able to educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like you when know, you we're, we educate ourselves. Like we've got kids who are like stepping out who 
who are functionally illiterate, who are in mm -hmm. freaking high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I mean, I've seen them. They can't, they can't put a sentence together, two sentences. Mm -hmm. Checked out. I work in a transfer high school, so I'm like seeing the, right. work, mm -hmm. the, the, the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, not the bottom. I mean, some of them are really bright, but they don't have any of the study skills, any of the right. capacities. Whose responsibility is that to teach? Because I think that there's a lot of question about who's, whose responsibility is that. I mean, it's the parents, parents going, you know? It's, it's I, I just had this conversation with my husband because he was like, well, we failed her. The older one. Uh, she the four-year-old. The four-year-old, right. Because, you know, we're not doing a bang-up job there, you know? She's like, she, she just, this is just who she is as a person, like, kind of shuts down a little bit when things are hard. Like, no, push it through. You have to work through it, you know? Um... And so that's our fault. So we're just working on that. But needless to say, like, so you know, the, depending on whatever school we choose, like they'll they'll step in. And then I blew up. I was like, that's not their responsibility. I'm on the phone telling him about the tour and whatever. I was like, no, that's not their responsibility. That's our responsibility. Like we have to. We are our first teachers. You know, like they are. She's spending time there. She spends a lot of time there. You know. Mm -hmm. 8, 10, 2, yeah. 30, but everything that you learn, you're learning first from your people at home, at you home, know, and so you're setting the foundation, it's like, it's the parent's responsibility, whoever is watching the child, whoever's responsible for the child, and if that person didn't necessarily, that that wasn't a priority or a value or whatever, then they're obviously not going to transfer it over, you know? Right, and, and a lot of stuff is going to transfer yeah. over, right. and I think that fundamentally you have to deal with kind of the emotional state of the kids not everyone has ideallic homes. Right. Everyone has nope. two Most people right. don't have exactly. ideallic homes. Right. But I mean, right. you know, some people have more than others. And, you know, you're, you're getting, you know, you're, you see a, a group of people who are just basically don't come to school, aren't really functioning, functionally illiterate, have no capacity for patience. To work through this is, some of this is executive executive function, function. Yeah. skills yeah. that need to be cultivated yeah. from a very young age, and then there's also the just a, a love of learning part, that, right? That like needs to be, it's not still, right? right. right. But see, no. that's also a part of the conversation. Absolutely, the the executive function is a huge component. But then I, I think that something happens with the curriculum that really stifles that love of learning. Mm -hmm. And Ruben and I, we you know we were we grew up in Best Stuy and we went on. The Brooklyn Tech, but our experience was like you come home, you do, you went to school all day, you yeah. came home, you did three or four more hours worth of homework, yeah. you hand wrote everything out, and it was honestly it was painful, and it really for me it really took away the love of learning. Yeah. So by the time you get to like high school, you're like done, you're yeah. toast, and so that is something that we knew we did not want for our kids, and so you know we're. we're